Our next speaker is Mary Catherine Nagel of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. She's a playwright and she's a partner at Pipe Stem Law, a firm that specializes in federal Indian law and appellate litigation. I met Mary Catherine back in 2014 because she had written a play called Sliver of a Full Moon. Using the technique of traditional Indian storytelling to weave together the emotional tales of abuse and rape of Native American women, along with the story of their fight to get Washington to pay attention. Recently, two of her plays had world premieres at major American regional theaters. Mary Catherine will speak about sovereignty of our nations in the law and over our bodies. Please welcome Mary Catherine Nagel. Um, good afternoon. It's an honor to, um, to speak with you this afternoon and to follow up on my dear sister's presentation, Sarah. And as she said, you know, we have um, been very fortunate to be able to work together on numerous briefs that we filed at the United States Supreme Court in the last five years on behalf of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Um, one of our speakers here happens to be the president of their board of directors, so you'll be hearing from her. But that work is so critically important. And you know, Sarah went very in depth into um, the history of how we've survived the last 500 years of violence and why we're still here today. I'm going to touch on some similar topics, but from the perspective of, okay, um, it's important to understand our sovereignty. It's important to understand how we've survived, but how, what tools have been used to take our sovereignty away from us? Why do we have a Supreme Court decision saying that tribes cannot exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who come onto our lands and commit crimes? That certainly wasn't the law of the land in 1491, right? And I think it is so critically important to understand that Congress, President Obama, in signing the law, VAWA 2013, those were huge steps, but those were steps to restore what is in inherently ours, and that is the right of our nations to do what they've always been doing since time immemorial. Congress doesn't give tribes jurisdiction. The United States doesn't give us the ability to prosecute non-Indians. It, it was, I think, superficially taken away in a Supreme Court decision in 1978 that we'll get to in a minute, but um, it is so important to understand that what we're working today is to restore not just our inherent understanding that women are sacred, but our inherent laws and traditions and legal frameworks that protected our women since time memorial. And they were purposely torn down, right? There's a reason that the military and strategic goal was to eradicate our nation's ability to protect our women. Because think about it, why are our women sacred? Well, for many reasons, but in a very, um, functional manner, we produce the next generation of citizens for our nations. So if you wipe out women, you wipe out the nation. That's, I mean, that is a large reason why our women have been attacked and targeted. Okay, so there is an actual PowerPoint here that I'm going to get to. So, um, you know, I think it's so important to know where we came from, and it's been, um, it's been an honor and a blessing to be able to do this work with Sarah. She showed you her law from Muscogee Creek Nation in 1824. I'm gonna tell, talk to you a little bit about what was happening at Cherokee Nation at the time. Um, on the left here is my great-great-great-grandfather, John Ridge, who served as the clerk to our Cherokee Nation Tribal Council. His father, Major Ridge, was the speaker of our Tribal Council for many years. And that, of course, is where they're buried today in northeastern Oklahoma. I understand where I come from and that these two men, my grandfathers, fought for our nation's sovereignty when the United States was trying to eradicate that, our nation, and all of our citizens. Um, this is a law, if you look at the very bottom, you'll see John Ross was the president of the committee, Major Ridge was the speaker, Major Ridge is my great, 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 great grandfather. This is a law, so um, in 1825, the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council passed a law criminalizing the rape of women, and if you realize, if you look at what the text says of the law, that any person or persons whatsoever who shall lay violent hands upon any female 
person or persons. This law was not limited to Cherokee Nation citizens or any other citizen or group. It was all persons. And we opened our own Cherokee Nation Supreme Court around this time. We had a Supreme Court at Cherokee Nation 20 years before the state of Georgia opened their own Supreme Court. We prosecuted anyone who came onto Cherokee lands. If you raped a woman on Cherokee lands, it didn't matter if you were a citizen of France, the state of Georgia, Creek Nation, Cherokee Nation, Choctaw Nation. If you raped a woman on Cherokee lands, you would be prosecuted. And that was the understanding under the law. And no one at that time um, certainly there were folks who wanted to eradicate our sovereignty and move us off of our lands, but there wasn't a Supreme Court decision at that time saying you can't do that. And this is just so critically important because I think, for instance, um, we're facing a reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act right now. In fact, um, there have been hearings on it on the Hill, and there are going to be votes probably on the floor of the House, maybe by early April. Um, just a week or two ago, everything is blurring a little bit together for me. I've been <laughs> flying around the country and doing different things. But, so I can't remember the exact date of it, but when, when the bill was up, uh, sent for markup before the Judiciary Committee, Congressman Sensenbrenner um, offered an amendment to not only strike the provisions in the current reauthorization of VAWA that Representative Holland just spoke about in her video, like the, the NITOPA Act, um, which would restore tribal criminal jurisdiction over assaults against tribal law enforcement. Sensenbrenner's amendment wasn't just about striking the additional restorations of tribal criminal jurisdiction that we now seek. But his amendment would strike all of the criminal jurisdiction that was restored to tribes in 2013. That's outrageous. And, and so you think, okay, well, what is his argument for striking the tribal criminal jurisdiction that was restored in 2013? Basically, all he said on the floor when he spoke in favor of his bill was that, well, we know tribal criminal jurisdiction of United States citizens is unconstitutional. Well, how do we know that, right? Where in the United States Constitution does it say, now that we're establishing this government, all the governments that predated us on this land no longer have jurisdiction over our citizens? Nothing in the Constitution says that. Tribal nations predate the United States. So tribal jurisdiction over non-Indians isn't unconstitutional, it's just pre-constitutional. Thank you. Um, so, Sarah and I, I guess, have a lot of time on our hands because we write a lot of things together. But uh, one day we were like, we're really bored. What should we do? How about a law review article? <laughs> um, so um, we actually published, so I encourage everyone to look it up. It's in the Harvard Journal on Gender and the Law. But after the Dollar General case that Sarah spoke about, you know, we actually thought this is, this is kind of a big deal because, you know, and I'll get to it in a minute, but in 1978, the Supreme Court in Oliphant said tribes no longer have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. Well, in 2015, Dollar General, who was being held liable in tribal court at the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians for civil claims, not criminal claims, because their non-Indian employee in their store on the res um, had sexually assaulted a 13-year-old tribal citizen multiple times. And so the parents brought a negligent supervision case, which is a very vanilla tort case that if you go to law school, you'll study in the first year. Negligent supervision, basically you're not supervising your employee because he's sexually assaulting a child in the store repeatedly. Um, Dollar General's response was, well, the, the tr we can't be held accountable to answer to these civil claims because tribes have no jurisdiction over non-Indians. And basically they said to the Supreme Court, hey, wink, wink, look, in 78 you eliminated tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. Get it done. Do it to civil as well. Make it so that we don't have to be held accountable in any tribal court for any claim, whether it's civil or criminal. And that's what that fight was about in Dollar General. So when we had a 4-4 decision... That upheld the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals decision, which said, yes, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians Tribal Court does have jurisdiction over Dollar General, who operates their store on their land and signed a lease and agreed to and consented to be subject to tribal court jurisdiction and all these other things we could talk about. But that was actually a victory, even though it was a tie, because that upheld the Fifth Circuit's decision upholding the tribe's jurisdiction. And also, you know, what Sarah and I wrote in this article is if you think about it, you know, that's four votes against Oliphant, essentially, right? Because Dollar General made that ask. Dollar General said the same jurisprudential rationale behind Oliphant should apply in civil jurisdiction. If you believe Oliphant's good law, you should take away tribes' civil jurisdiction over non-Indians. And we had four justices vote no. We still had four justices vote yes. 
and we have a lot of work to do. You know, it was just last year that the first native law clerk ever was hired by a justice on the United States Supreme Court, ever in the history of the United States. That's incredible when you think about how many cases the Supreme Court decides that impacts our sovereignty and the right of our nations to protect our citizens, to function as tribal governments. And here we are in the United States where we think, oh, but it's all about diversity. Everyone has a seat at the table. Well, why didn't any of the justices for the last 200 years hire a single citizen of a tribe? Um, finally, Justice Gorsuch hired, has hired one, and that's remarkable. But going back to this article that I was telling you about that Sarah and I wrote, uh, we, we said, let's focus on Worcester v. Georgia. Because if you, let's, you know, again, we're very caught in this post-1978 framework. We know, we all, you know, as tribal citizens, we know we're not protected on our lands. We know, you know, with the exception of what was restored in 2013, for the most part, if a non-Indian rapes us or attacks us in our home, our government can't protect us. We know that, but that hasn't always been the case. And in fact, Worcester v. Georgia is highly significant for many reasons. One, it was the Supreme Court decision in 1832. And most people know this as sort of the, the Cherokee removal case, that Cherokee Nation fought, won in the Supreme Court. Andrew Jackson refused to enforce it. Cherokees were removed on the Trail of Tears. It's a story that's very personal to me because my great-great-grandfather was one of the first Native attorneys in the history of the United States. He couldn't argue this case on behalf of Cherokee Nation because back then, Indians, of course, weren't allowed to argue in federal courts. But um, they had to hire the former Attorney General under John Adams, William Wirt, to argue on behalf of Cherokee Nation. But he helped write the briefs. And he worked with Principal Chief um, John Ross on this case. But it wasn't just about Cherokee removal. Of course it was about that. But it was about the right of tribal nations to protect their citizens. Because what happened in this case was Georgia was trying everything they could to remove Cherokee Nation. And so they passed numerous laws. They outlawed our government. I mean, they did a lot of things that I think were unconstitutional under the United States Constitution. But one of the laws they passed was a law saying, all right, any citizen of the United States who enters Cherokee lands cannot do so unless they have written permission, unless they've signed an oath to the governor of Georgia saying, I abide by Georgia's laws, not Cherokee Nation's laws. So they made it illegal for United States citizens to come onto Cherokee lands. Well, numerous white missionaries came onto Cherokee lands without signing the governor's paper, the governor of Georgia's paper. What happened? Georgia came onto Cherokee lands, arrested Samuel Wooster, a white missionary from Vermont, and the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And what was the legal question? The legal question was, who has criminal jurisdiction over white American citizens on tribal lands? And Georgia said, well, Cherokee Nation, there's no way they have that jurisdiction. They're, they're a tribe. They're uncivilized, they're savage, blah, blah, blah. All the rhetoric that was thrown at us back then that, you know, for the most part is still out there today in terms of the narrative that shapes our laws. It just may not be hitting you in the face as directly as it was in 1832. And what was Cherokee Nation's response? Georgia doesn't have any jurisdiction over American citizens on Cherokee lands. That's our jurisdiction. If you're on Cherokee lands, we are the exclusive sovereign with jurisdiction over any crime committed on our lands. And the Supreme Court agreed. And so they agreed as to Cherokee Nation, but think about what was also happening at that time. Sarah showed you the Creek Nation law. That law applied to non-Indians as well. We had several tribes in the Southeast at the epicenter of the um, efforts to remove tribal nations where tribal nations were prosecuting non-Indians who raped native women on tribal lands. And in 1832, the Supreme Court said, the only sovereign with jurisdiction to, to prosecute crimes committed on tribal lands is the tribal government. That's huge. How did we lose that? Well, Andrew Jackson refused to enforce it. And then he purposely stacked the Supreme Court with justices he thought would abide his mission to eradicate tribal sovereignty, tribal jurisdiction, and ultimately tribal nations. And we've sort of been living in the after effects of this ever since. Now, there's some glimmering hopes, I would say, with Justice Sotomayor on the bench, Justice Gorsuch, um, the decision that just came out of the Supreme Court this week about the Yakima Treaty rights. I mean, I think, you know, we're starting to see a turn, but it's a turn from something that was put in place by, by Jackson's legacy, truly. Um, okay, I think I gotta keep making progress here. Um, but this is important too, right? Here's Andrew Jackson's quote to Congress about, about Native people. They have neither the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, nor the desire of improvement which are essential to any favorable change in their condition. Established in the midst of another and a superior race, and without appreciating the causes of their inferiority or seeking to control them, they must necessarily yield to the force of circumstances and ere long disappear. 
This was the President of the United States in 1833 after he refused to enforce the Supreme Court's decision in Worcester v. Georgia. That rhetoric, as appalling as it sounds, has not been, um, we haven't had a moment in American history where we've actually collectively stood up and said, that is wrong, and we disown that. That's actually not, um, that's not in line with American democratic principles. That's not in line with our Constitution. We have yet to have that kind of reconciliation here in the United States. I think this is a large part a contributor to the high rates of violence that our, our women face. Our women face high rates of violence for military strategic reasons, reasons over history that we've discussed, but also because we've been dehumanized as a people. Um, but what happened? So in 1832, the Supreme Court says only tribes can exercise criminal jurisdiction over crimes committed on tribal lands. We have a total reversal in 1978, Oliphant. How do we explain, how do we justify Oliphant? The facts of Oliphant are um, somewhat appalling as well. I mean, this was Oliphant versus the Squamish Indian tribe. Basically, Oliphant, a white guy, came onto tribal lands, got really drunk, and started, uh, and of course, when the tribal law enforcement said, okay, you're, you're really drunk, why don't you, why don't we get you off the streets here? You're gonna cause, you're, you know, you are harmed to public safety. He started assaulting the law enforcement. He started punching the police officer. He then got into his car, engaged in a high-speed chase. Thankfully, no lives were lost. The tribe arrested him and prosecuted him, and he took the case all the way up to the Supreme Court, and he said, this is unconstitutional. This tribe is trying to exercise criminal jurisdiction over me, and it's unconstitutional for tribes to exercise such jurisdiction. Um, Okay, so how did the Supreme Court reach its decision that tribes can no longer exercise this jurisdiction? The Supreme Court, um, theoretically, predicates all of its decisions on uh, precedent, cases that have come before it, excuse me, and says, okay, here's this law, well, we're make reaching this decision because this previous decision says this, or this statute from Congress says this, or this statement, in the, you know, this provision in the United States Constitution says this. Most of what Oliphant is predicated on is a factual narrative that is false and a doctrine from a case from 1823 that is just racist and based on prejudice. So one, one Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote the decision. Um, one thing he said, and I quote, the effort by Indian tribal courts to exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians, however, is a relatively new phenomenon. Now, he didn't cite a single historical record for that statement. He just said, look, part of the reason why tribes can't exercise this jurisdiction is they just didn't in the past, so why should they get to do it today? I don't understand how he came to this conclusion other than ignorance. I know a lot of federal judges in this country you know, have never set foot in a tribal court, don't understand, you know, our schools, our K through 12 you know, education, our college education, the curriculum in those institutions on tribal sovereignty is, um, if it exists at all, problematic probably. And so I doubt he, he learned of nations like my nation and Sarah's nation that did have courts before the state of Georgia and before other states in existence at the time that were prosecuting non-natives who came onto our lands and committed crimes, who are, you know, I think doing a better job of protecting women than the individual states. So that's a false narrative, and it gave rise to this decision. Chief Justice Rehnquist also cited a case called Johnson v. McIntosh. And he said in 1978, quote, their rights to complete sovereignty as independent nations are necessarily diminished. Okay, where does that line of rationale come from? Well, it comes from an 1823 Johnson v. McIntosh decision, which is highly problematic. Um, this is what the Supreme Court said in 1823. I've highlighted the most problematic quote in red. Conquest gives a title which the courts of the conqueror could not deny. It's a pretty problematic idea. So um, basically in 1823, the question before the Supreme Court was, can tribal nations still claim legal title to their land? And I could go into a long lecture about how this issue came up to the Supreme Court. It was actually two white people fighting over land that they both claimed to have either taken or bought from um, a tribal nation, or one had taken from. It, in any event, the issue was, well, um, the Supreme Court had to decide, can tribal nations continue to claim title to their land? And the Supreme Court said, no. As soon as a white person discovers their land, they no longer have legal title to it. It's a pretty problematic case. Um, there are other quotes that 
from this case in 1823 that are problematic. For instance, quote, but the tribes inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. Couple reactions. Um, what's wrong with hunting in a forest? I mean, that's like one of the most sacred constitutional protections today in the United States. So somehow our people are savages because we hunted for food. Um, I don't understand that. Second of all, uh, we were farmers. We were very sophisticated farmers. In fact, the folks who washed up on our shores here 500 years ago would have starved to death if we, if we hadn't taught them how to farm. So again, these are legal decisions based on false narratives, right? That, we, that um, you know, we're just uncivilized savages who don't farm, apparently. And then that means we can't claim legal title to our land. Um, the court also said, you know, referred to basically, um, you know, this, this doctrine of discovery is a Christian principle that actually initially had been announced by the Pope. And so the, the court in this 1823 decision also worked that in. But, you know, overall, the real problem here is, you know, we've got a Supreme Court case on the books from 1823 saying Indians are savages because they don't know how to farm and they hunt. And then in 1978, the Supreme Court says, well, that case is the reason they can't exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. That's the legal framework from our Supreme Court today that we're still living in. We have not had our Brown v. Board of Education that overturns our Plessy v. Ferguson. We've had Congress say, and, and at the end of Oliphant, and this is important, at the end of Oliphant, the Supreme Court said, all right, we recognize there's a lot of violence against Native people on tribal lands. So maybe tribes should still have this jurisdiction to prosecute non-Indians. But we, the court, we're not the institution to say yes or no to tribal jurisdiction. That's, that's for Congress to decide. That's within Congress's constitutional power. The Supreme Court said that. Check it out. Last sentence in Oliphant, 1978. So here we are, and now we're in a world where Congress is working to restore this jurisdiction in line with what the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said in 1978. And we've got people on the Hill like Congressman Sinsenbrenner who want to eradicate any tribal criminal jurisdiction that's been restored on the grounds that somehow tribal criminal jurisdiction is unconstitutional. So what's the solution to this? And I will say, um, I think Sarah and I have the same photo in our... <laughs> we were both there that day. In fact, we both filed a brief together, and it was a very, very powerful day. If you Google... Dollar General, Supreme Court, um, NIWRC, um, or just Native women, you'll see there are a bunch of video, YouTube videos online you can watch of the different, we had, we had tribal leaders, we had tribal court judges, we had Native women survivors, we had a whole speaker stand, and we had hundreds of Native women who brought shawls, and we're out there just praying. Uh, it was a very, very powerful day. But, but we know that the high rates of violence against our women are in part due to the fact, you know, the Department of Justice has, you know, the studies that Sarah referred to, the majority of the violent crimes committed against our people are committed by non-Indians. Yes, members of our own community, communities do commit acts of violence, and we could go into the psychology of that and the learned behavior of abuse from boarding schools and all these other forms, right? But at the same time, what, what does that tell our women when the majority of the crimes committed against them, their government doesn't have the right to protect them? What does that tell our women? So, um, you know, we've known, and there are many different tribal nations who have sayings to this effect, right? This, this is, again, um, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I think all of our nations respected women as sacred. The Cheyenne have a saying, the nation shall be strong so long as the hearts of the women are not on the ground. If you think about that, think about the U.S. military strategy. Well, if we wipe out their women, we wipe out the nation. It's why women were targeted at massacres like Sand Creek, right? It's why women are targeted on the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears wasn't just about moving. It was also an attempted eradication, and it failed, but it was an attempted eradication. Um, this is a quote that I love from the former um, uh, chairwoman of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and she was also former co-chair of the National Congress of American Indians Task Force on Violence Against Women. Quote, Terry Henry is her name. Quote, sovereignty and safety are hand in glove. The sovereignty of Indian tribes is connected to the safety of Native women. This connection is the natural relationship of a people to their nation. It is also the natural relationship of a government to protect and safeguard the lives of its citizens. It is kind of crazy that this is what we're fighting for today. In the United States, we as Native women have to fight for the United States to recognize the right of our nations to just protect us from rapists and those who want to harm us. It's, it's, it's pretty radical. 
Um, but we do have our victories. And, and, and here's another photo from when President Obama signed the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act into law in 2013, March 7th, 2013. And you see Deb Parker here on stage. Um, and also, I know Sarah mentioned Diane Millich, who's here on the left to introduce the president. Um, you know, again, the Violence Against Women Act in 2013 restored tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian perpetrated crimes of dating violence, um, domestic violence, and criminal violation of protection orders. What it does not cover is, for instance, stranger rape, um, sex trafficking, um, domestic violence crimes or sexual assault crimes against our children, or if one of our tribal law enforcement officers shows up to, um, a, to answer a 911 call and the perpetrator's a non-Indian, they may have jurisdiction over the domestic violence crime that's being committed. But what happens when that non-Indian starts assaulting the police officer? That's not a domestic violence crime. Police officer doesn't have jurisdiction today under the current legal framework post-1978. Again, had that jurisdiction before 1978, had it since time immemorial, haven't had it since 1978. So a lot of the advocates um, working to restore tribal criminal jurisdiction are advocating that, you know, what Representative Holland referred to, the um, Native Youth Tribal Police Officer Protection Act, NITOPA, um, Justice for Native Survivors of Sexual Assault. That act will restore tribal criminal jurisdiction over stranger rape, sex trafficking, crimes of that nature, where you don't have that intimate relationship necessary to form a domestic violence crime. Right? So today, if you don't have, a, if it's a stranger and you don't have that intimate relationship, there's no tribal criminal jurisdiction. Um, so this is the actual statute, which you can look up online, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to keep going here. We talked about the Dollar General case, um, so I'm going to keep going. Um, you know, uh, these are some of Justice Kennedy's harmful questions during Dollar General, where he basically said, um, when, and this is why I think it's so critically important to, again, to understand that Congress did not give us jurisdiction in 2013. They simply restored what the Supreme Court wrongfully and unconstitutionally took away in 1978 based on jurisprudence that were savages and heathens and don't know how to farm, okay? So, but here's Justice Kennedy during the 2015 Dollar General argument asking questions about, well, could, con so he's trying to, Dollar General's arguing that tribes should have no civil jurisdiction over non-Indians, and Kennedy brings up criminal, which, is not even at issue in the case. He says, well, could Congress pass a law saying that all 500 plus Indian tribes in the United States have unlimited criminal authority, could impose life sentences on non-tribal members, American citizens? He continues, um, my hypothetical is that Congress gives Indian powers, complete powers, both civil and criminal, over all persons, no federal review, nothing, and he takes it even further. He goes, well, if the Congress of the United States gives the United Nations authority over our citizens, just so long as they say there has to be due process, they're, you know, they're not a constitution, it doesn't really make a lot of sense when I start reading his comments out loud, um, so let me help try to make sense of what I think Justice Kennedy was getting at. He's trying to make the point of, What's happening in VAWA 2013 is Congress is just giving jurisdiction over American citizens to tribes, and that's unconstitutional because Congress can't just give jurisdiction over American citizens to other entities. Again, fundamental misunderstanding of the history of the nations on this land that predate the United States and the laws that we had up until 1978. So, um, and this is, again, folks outside, we won, um, even though it was a four to four tie, but what, what is the remedy? Um, you know, I do a lot of work as a lawyer, and I'm very honored to do that work. I'm also a playwright. And, you know, laws are shaped on narratives. Laws are shaped on stories that we tell. Sometimes they're harmful stories. You know, um, this group of people, they're not equal to this group of people. This people are a superior race to this people. Those are narratives that shape our laws. Um, women are property of their husbands. That's the narrative that shaped the law in the majority of states up until 1976, where it was legal to rape your wife. If you were married, it was your right to have sex whenever you wanted. It didn't matter if she didn't consent. There was no such thing as rape within a marriage until 1976 in most states in the United States. Those laws come from narratives. Oliphant comes from a narrative, and I just read to you the text, that we're savage, that we're racially inferior, we don't know how to farm, we're uncivilized. So how do we change the laws? You have to change the narrative. And for most non-Native Americans in the United States, the harmful narratives about us 
are just as much as they're about prejudice, they're also about ignorance. They're about our invisibility, right? They just don't see us. They don't think about us. So the harmful precedents that are on the books aren't even being discussed in law schools. Most law students don't read Oliphant. And so one solution um, I started working with, and actually this is a photo from when we did Sliver of a Full Moon, my play here on this stage. And uh, the fourth person from the left is Lisa Bruner, um, whose story was shared earlier today. And um, was Diane Millich in this? Yeah. Is she Yep, oh, yep, there she is. Okay, she's, uh, so right next to, with the um, ribbon skirt is Melissa Brady and um, from Spirit Lake Nation. And then next to her, to her right, is Diane Millich. And of course, there's me with my eyes closed. But um, never a good photo. But um, we've taken this play all over the country. We've taken it to Yale Law School, Harvard Law School, Stanford Law School. My hope is that we've done it for students who will go clerk on the Supreme Court. I can't tell you how many of them came up to me and said, I didn't know Oliphant existed. I, I didn't read it in law school, no one told, how, how is it that there's a Supreme Court case saying that you all can't be safe in your own homes? So there is a lot of work to do through art to change the law. And so I'm just gonna show a really quick clip of, okay, and thankfully I have Rick here to help me. Most people want to pretend we don't exist, but the truth is we're still here. We'll always be here. We will never leave. Alaska, the state has a bit of doom mentality. First it was the Russian and fur, then the Americans and gold. Now, the, now it's the oil and the pipeline. But my people, we have been here for thousands of years from the time of the glacier until now. We were here before the Russians. We were here when they came. Our men gave them fur and in exchange gave us alcohol. And then they took our women. This one. We had no choice. Just one night, I'll bring her back. We had Columbus. We had the Russians. Tell me, how is that different? This is my story. This is my story. This is my story. The story of my sister. My daughter. The story of my mother. And her mother. And her mother's mother. My grandmother. My granddaughter. This is the story. Of my life. Of my past. Of my people. This, this is, is my, my story. story. At first, it was hard to share it. I had to keep it a secret. I was too ashamed. Too embarrassed. Too afraid. Scared. Forgotten. I was silenced. I thought I'd be judged. For something I never did. But then we came together. We, we stopped, stopped the, the silence. silence. If I wasn't native, my story would be different. If I didn't live on my reservation, my story would be different. If I wasn't a citizen of a sovereign Indian nation, my story would be different. I live in Alaska when it comes to justice. That shouldn't make my story any different. This, this is, is my story. story. And I'm here to share it. One sunny afternoon in May, I was returning my daughters to their father for our agreement. I dropped them off and made sure he was home. And so, um, so actually what you just saw, that was our performance at Harvard. And um, you saw Lisa Bruner and Nat... Nat Hedy Warbelow, who's at the Baskin from Alaska, sharing her story. And I actually had to step in and read for Diane Millich in that performance because she got stuck in Denver uh, with, in a blizzard. We, this was in November, and we were, she had to, getting to Boston was difficult. But we've taken this play around the country, and I think it's really helped to educate a lot of folks about the problems of Oliphant. And these are the women who fought for VAWA 2013 and who are still fighting today for further um, restoration of jurisdiction. Um, just to touch on a couple of my other plays that were mentioned, this is from Sovereignty, which we did here at Arena Stage just over a year ago. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, in that play, there is a hypothetical, which we know is slightly in inevitable, non-Indian challenge to the constitutionality of VAWA's restored tribal criminal jurisdiction, and a Cherokee attorney gets to argue in the Supreme Court for the constitutionality of tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. And um, this is some of the text from her, her oral argument before the Supreme Court in the play. I'll just read to you a little bit. Um, she says, nothing about us or our government is inferior. Petitioners' arguments that Indian nations cannot exercise jurisdiction over non-Indians finds no support in the Constitution. Tribal jurisdiction over non-Indians predates the United States Constitution. So tribal jurisdiction isn't unconstitutional, it's pre-constitutional. And no sovereign, not even the United States, can strip my nation of its inherent right to protect me and my fellow Cherokee women. Thank you. Wadon. 
So that is a powerful moment in the play. And in my play, we win. Um, and again, you know, it's narrative, right? So now we've got all these folks in DC. In fact, Justice Ginsburg came and saw it. Members from the Senate and Congress came and saw it. Um, now they've seen a narrative where they see that pathway forward where tribal jurisdiction is constitutional. So there's a, there's a real power in the stories we tell. This is another photo from Sovereignty. This is Andrew Jackson facing off with my grandfathers, John Ridge and Major Ridge. Um, and so, I'll just leave you with this. Um, you know, the stories we tell are so in incredibly important and powerful. And until we fully change the law, we have got to rehumanize ourselves, um, our nations, our, the citizens of our nations, in the eyes of non-natives here in the United States. And I think one of the most powerful ways we can do that is through storytelling. So thank you so much. Well done. Thank you, Mary Catherine, for your incredibly moving presentation. I've seen Sliver of a Full Moon many times, and it still sends chills up my spine to see a clip of it. Thank you.